so we're looking at, uh, again, Terry Eagleton's literary theory, and in particular, the fourth chapter on post-structuralism. And um, we were just talking before the class about um, the contemporary landscape and how uh, this work relates to it. And uh, one of the trajectories of the course, which I think I mentioned right in the introduction to the course, is in the co contemporary literary theories increasingly move away from humanism, which you can still see in the Romantic period from last semester. It's a different type of humanism, and it's a Gnostic form of humanism, I would say. And, it, and, and so it's already anti-Christian in some sense, but it's still a humanism. And Wordsworth and Coleridge and the German Romantics and Kant and the idealists, they all think that there is something called human nature and that we all share it in common and that there can be a general approach to the humanities because of that. There's a commonality there. And so when Kant does his Copernican turn and makes the objects outside of us conform to our capacities to perceive it, he thinks that the uh, plural, our capacities, are shared by all people and there's no um, differentiation of, of types there. It's not a Western way of looking at things. It's not a German way of looking at things. It's not a female way of looking at things. It's not a queer way of looking at things. It's a general structure of our capacities to perceive the world, which makes it still a, 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 a general humanistic theory because it's shared in common. And so there's a common good still possible there. And so Kant makes with his critique of pure reason and the other critiques, ideas that he thinks apply universally at all times and all places. In fact, that's what he tries to do. He makes it under all conditions. What are the conditions of understanding? And they would be in every possible world, every possible world, and have always been true. So he, it gets projected backwards as a way of reading history. Uh, so it's a romantic way of looking at it. And then Friedrich Schleiermacher in his hermeneutics uh, gives a methodology for doing it. And out of that arise the Geisteswissenschaft and the spiritual sciences and the way of reading texts. Um, but in the postmodern literary theories, which arise from this, we start to see that we do get uh, questioning of exactly this general capacity of understanding the world it becomes problematized at all times. And it is in part because we become aware of the fact that we exist. It, existence itself is presented as a problem for the first time. So when you could say it's Leighton in Descartes. When he says, I think, therefore I am, he's already forefronted the fact that he is before um, or I guess he's forefront of the fact that he thinks, but he's, he's presented his existence prior to God's existence in the, in the chain of logic that he uh, initiates there. And so he's created the, the problem of understanding and human being as the central problem that the, West, the, 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 the modern way of looking at the world needs to come to terms with. And in but in Descartes' terms, it's still in a very abstract form. He thinks of it in terms of being. He doesn't think of it in terms of existence. In terms of existence, we deal with the specific conditions of human being and the finite conditions of human being. And that's not what Descartes means when he talks about being. He means being in an absolute sense, not as a lived experience. But the 20th century very much emphasized the lived experience of human being, the finite the specific, the, the temporal, um, and for that matter, the embodied form of, of being. So there's the difference between a, a woman's experience and a man's experience, or, or a, you know, an anglophone's experience and a francophone's experience, or a queer experience from a, heter uh, a heterosexual experience. The, all these experiences are problematized and seen as the uh, the obstacles to understanding texts. And uh, as I say, for, so we no longer 
you know, I'll use an illustration that C.S. Lewis, Lewis uses here. We can't just look at a rose and describe a rose. We have to think about our, uh, ourselves thinking about the rose. We're always inserted into that process. We can no longer talk about the beauty of the rose. We're talked about ourselves in relation to the rose at all times. And that ourselves in relation to the rose is not a universal self. It is a, an individualized, finite, very personal self. And so what the effect of that is on the humanities is it, it is going to destroy the humanities. There is no humanity. There are simply humanities in the plural. And the humanities in the plural are irreducibly different. That's the trajectory of contemporary literary theory. It problematizes existence. What it notices it, first of all, um, and, and focuses on it. And it's an obstacle to it. And then it, in particular, focuses on the problem of language that arises from, from the uh, postulate of existentialism. Because my language may be the same words that you use, but do you mean the same things as I do because your self is different from myself? And how do I know that? Well, because you have a different body, you have a different finite space, etc. So we need a certain type, when we're looking at the rose, we need a certain type of mind and a certain type of eyes, and the certain type of mind and the certain type of eyes that, are, uh, that we have shift from the time of Kant and Schleiermacher, where the eyes are seen as a view from nowhere. I described this before. Where there are universal eyes and a universal mind with no actual physical eyes and no physical mind or physical brain. It's, it's, a, it's a hypothetical self, shorn of prejudice and limitation. So let's just talk about the general conditions for all possibilities of understanding. Let's talk about it from that perspective. And that's how it begins to, and I, I said to you, it's really dealing though with a, a step backwards with the problem of the humanities that was conceived in looking at language as Rousseau and company did in the early 18th century. So rather than looking at the world through the language of revelation, God's self impartation, in scripture. God reveals himself. This is what reality is, and we conform to that reality. He gives us the terms of understanding, the conditions of understanding, the capacity for understanding. We bear his image. There's a whole chain of necessary conditions there for knowledge to take place, uh, but, they, but they're assumed in the 17th century, even for the scientific revolution, they are assumed that we can understand the world, we should understand the world, because God has given us his dominion mandate, be fruitful, multiply, fill, and subdue the earth. You're to understand it. You're to act as if it were your duty to act as God's vice region on earth. And because you have a mind that's like God's mind, you are able to understand it. And, and furthermore, the words that you use can address and describe those things. So for example, the rose, the word rose describes the rose. It doesn't matter if it's a different word in a different language. It's still describing the rose. We know it's that thing that smells beautiful. That's, that's what we're describing. But, but once we talk about language originating not in uh, God's revelation, but in our self-revelation, we are aware of ourself in the mix. And once we're aware of ourselves, the problem of knowledge becomes insuperable. Does that make sense? Because that, that, that's the trajectory I've been trying to describe, and I think it unfolds over the course of centuries to the point now where we are where we are, where the academy is really not sure that it's possible to know anything, and in fact will say that the claim that we can reason about things in a common sense is white knowledge, or it's, or it's oppressive, or it's colonialist, or whatever, all the charges that are thrown for asserting that knowledge is possible. They'll just say, well, that's a very oppressive perspective to claim that there is such a thing. Even though it's an all-inclusive term, this is the thing that I find rather ironic, is that it's all-inclusive. It, if I say it's true of everyone, then I'm literally including everyone. I'm excluding no one. 
You'll say, yes, but you're using a, a form of understanding that, that arose in the Western world, which is true. But that doesn't mean it's exclusive of people outside the Western world. And that's their, but their presupposition is that it must be because it originated at a particular place and time. And therefore, it isn't the view from nowhere. It's a view from somewhere, and the somewhere is the West. And it's from the uh, writings of white, dead European males. And furthermore, it has a Christian legacy. So all of these things, the logocentrism that you claim is general and universal is finite, particular, and, uh, and now redundant. Stephen, do you want to jump in? Because I see you. No, I, okay. I, I just, I mean, yes, I, I do. Yes and no. I, yeah. I, I just want to, uh, I don't know if this is exactly a question, but my thoughts immediately go to the uh, uh, universality of the uh, search for truth and philosophy, mm -hmm. whether that is, as we have already established, the ancient Greek philosophy, the, uh, the Christian uh, philosophies, uh, East and West, and also the Islamic school of philosophy and the uh, Far Eastern uh, Confucian and Taoist uh, schools of philosophy. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems to me uh, that even if uh, we were to grant like uh, a, a search for truth as a universal, um, it's, it, it doesn't seem to me that a philosophical approach is particularly excluded to one school because philosophy is 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 such uh, like like I don't know how uh, someone can object to the use of philosophy the use of a search for an absolute truth when philosophy is so uh, universal in so many different cultures and religions. You would have thought, yeah. 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 There, the, I think there are some, so I th it's, a, first of all, a very good observation. So you, you don't understand why there is even an objection. Given that we're talking about a common human characteristic, we're not saying it's, we're teaching Western knowledge here uh, as opposed to Eastern knowledge. And that's true. However, it's also the case that in Eastern religions, they don't think that knowledge is possible. That's the problem. So there is a fundamental disagreement there in the philosophical or even religious traditions of the East that we can even know certain things because everything's Maya, it's an illusion, right? And, and, and the world, uh, and, and, and for that reason, I think science arises in the West for the, re for the very reasons that I suggested earlier. We think that no, it is possible to gain knowledge and not only is it possible, it's good to do it to know more, to know rightly as opposed to wrongly. It's, it's using God's gift of the mind to honor him, to understand things rightly and not to understand falsehoods and to propagate falsehoods. Whereas in some cultures, even if you thought it was possible to know things, you might say, but we shouldn't know it because it will anger the gods. We're, we're, we're going beyond the boundaries of the community's way of understanding the world and that's forbidden. You must not do that. It's a taboo to learn more. And we want to keep you uneducated because that preserves our culture. That's not it. So the Western world does clash with those sorts of fundamental problems there. Um, and in that sense, sure, it, 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 it is a Western form and it does clash with other cultures. It begs the question, though, of whether that's actually oppressive. That's another that's a, that's a charge, and it, I think it's a s charge without much substance myself, because being a delivered from falsehood and understanding the way things truly are, I would not regard as subjugation or oppression. It would be the exact opposite. It's deliverance. It's, it's initiating people into a way of living that is in conformity with the way things actually are. They're going to eat good things rather than eat poison. They're going to live in ways that will, will allow human, human life to flourish rather than human life to deteriorate or destroy itself, right? But again, you're in agreement with me because there's a certain context in what we've grown up and uh, we all assume those same things. And it is a Western way of looking at things. That doesn't mean it's not true. And this is the thing that most bothers the humanists and the general perspective 
of the Kantians, as it were, is that even though they are trying to come at it from a universal, applies it every place, every time, in the past, in the future, it, that idea of looking at it universally only arose in the context of Christianity. It, and it, it assumes all of the essential attributes of Christianity about the world being null, something we can know, something we should know, something that it's good to know, and that there are blessings from that knowledge. That's part of the Western philosophical tradition that they simply assume. And they don't even need to argue for it because it's so obvious to them that that be the case. Now, as for Islamic thought, I think Islamic thought is tied into that. And again, as Islam then would be in the West in that sense, even though if in other ways it's, it's different because they think, I think they will think that the world can be known, right? And, and that it's right to know it. And so there's an Islamic intellectual tradition that arises out of that. Um, there will be certain prohibitions or, you know, and, and sense of this is right and this is wrong uh, upon which we can agree or disagree. But the way we will then adjudicate that is through logical argument, because we assume the laws of logic apply. <laughs> because both uh, Islam and Christianity are going to have, at least in the tradition, have read Greek philosophy and, and agree with the laws of logic as Aristotle describes them. It, this is basic. To, if you can't acknowledge logic, you can't think. It's just not possible. But, but, but literary theory denies logic, its legitimacy because it denies the law of identity. That when I say this is this, I, I mean it's not that. And so there's the law of non-contradiction. So when I say somebody's a male, I'm saying that they're not a female. So a male is a male. We can say that that's the identity. We could get into that. I don't, I'm just gonna assert it here. A male is a male. That's it's a, his identity is this, and that means he's not a female. And he can't be both. It's either or, and that's part of the law of non-contradiction. You accept that. Contemporary literary theories deny that very thing. And that's why I say they're anti-humanistic. And really they're anti-logocentric to go back further to what we looked at uh, last two classes ago. Yeah, being at war with the word is actually being at war with human nature and the conditions of human nature and the conditions of understanding. But it's, it's in part because, just to conclude this before we get into Eagleton, it's because we, they problematize existence in a way that was not there in the past. As I say, I don't think that, although Descartes is moving in the direction because he makes it from the perspective of the doubting self, you, know, you start by doubting everything, including the past and tradition, uh, and just assume that I am doubting or I'm, I'm certain I'm doubting and therefore I'm thinking and therefore I exist and therefore I can I can imagine and being infinite in uh, form must exist, God exists. That gives way to further downstream consequences because it's, it's no longer rooted in uh, revelation. It's more in, in what I can determine for myself. And what I can determine for myself is unfortunately only dependent uh, to some degree on my empirical abilities. That, that's the only thing I can verify, experimentally. Through the lab, I can experiment. I can come to certain observations with, the, with very clear um, l demarcated lines of inquiry so that I'm not uh, allowing other factors to intrude upon the experiment. And other people can replicate it, and therefore it's a form of knowledge. Yes, but historical knowledge is precluded from that. No historical experience can be replicated in the lab. Well, that means that everything that is taught before us, which isn't just a physical aspect of the world, is excluded as knowledge. History is no longer knowledge. Theology is no longer knowledge. Religions are, other than the, the aspects of experience, are no longer considered knowledge. That's the effect of that. Uh, and eventually, the experience of sitting with your microscope and observing uh, the you know, the plankton on your, whatever you call them now. It's been so long since I did biology. Um, that, even that is problematized as an experience. 
It doesn't seem like it at the time, but over, over the course of time, we can see now even that. Because you have the, well, they'll say, but you, well, you have the Western implements of, of looking through the world. You have a microscope, but, but if you're uh, coming at it from uh, native forms of knowing, they won't use microscopes. They'll use smudging ceremonies to find, discern the will of the gods, etc. Right? And you'll have to go through a certain ritual, and that's the technique. You use the microscope, that's your technique. Here's our technique. And who's to say that this is not equally valid? You're just saying this is valid because, you know, uh, you're privileged and, and you're benefiting from it, etc. Anyway. Yes? Do you want to come back? No, no, no. Okay. Very good answer.